Do you ever wonder if the pros are teaching you to do one thing in Photoshop, but secretly doing another on their own photos? Or if there are some special techniques that they're holding back to keep for themselves? Well, in this video, I'm sharing seven simple but game-changing editing techniques that can give your photos a massive boost in quality and wow factor, but which I hardly see anyone ever teach. Now, if you've ever wondered why your landscapes turn out looking flat, even after you've used all the best techniques available for making colors and detail pop, then you might be missing this one crucial factor. Because you're often taught the technical side of things like how to make shadows brighter to reveal the detail within or to increase the contrast and saturation to make colors pop, for example, but you're rarely taught where you should use these techniques in your photos and why. And then as a result, you end up treating everything in your landscape scene the same, whether it's right up close in the foreground or way off in the distance. Here's the thing. As a general rule, things in the distance tend to be lighter and things in the foreground tend to be darker. And if you make adjustments with that rule in mind, then you'll see a new level of depth and three-dimensionality emerge in your landscapes that you might not have seen before. So rather than giving everything all around the image the same level of brightness and detail, just try leaving foreground objects relatively darker compared to those off in the distance and your photos are automatically going to appear to pop more. This next tip is for you if you've ever been frustrated because you wish that you'd lined your shot up a little bit better in camera or that ideal foreground composition just wasn't possible to capture at the time. And it also help if you want to fix the problem that wide angle lenses cause of making large things in the distance seem small. And plus it has the added bonus of being really quick and easy to do. It involves using the various transform tools like the warp tool for this example. First, you can select an area of the shot that you want to alter and then activate the warp tool. Quick side note, be careful with what you alter and by how much if your photo is of a well-known location because the last thing you want is people calling you out saying, hey, it's not really like that. But for most small things, it's all good. So with that in mind, carefully nudge your composition one way or another to line everything up better and create more balance like in this foreground. Or alternatively, you can use the warp tool to bring distant objects closer like with these mountains. And if you're worried about the realism that this last example gives, just consider whether those mountings actually seemed that small in real life when you captured the shot, or whether the wide angle lens actually distorted them to make them look smaller than they really were. Tip number three is similar to the last, but it requires an added level of creative freedom, shall we say. Because when you're at your computer working on a photo, and for whatever reason something just doesn't line up in the composition, you have a choice. Do you throw away the image and waste all of your effort capturing it in the first place? Do you stick to the truth of the scene and put out a subpar composition? Or do you allow for some creative liberties and make an image with a balanced composition that looks great? Assuming you want to do number three, here's what you can do. Take this image, for example. Pretty decent, but the foreground is a bit unbalanced because we have these large dark rocks over here on the right, but they leave a gap on the left where the water flow takes us out of the frame. So what can we do about it? Well, it's kind of dumb, but it works. So I'll use the object selection tool to select this whole rock. And then I'll copy and paste it onto a new layer. Next, I'll move the copy across to roughly fill in the gap, scaling it and rotating it until it looks like it kind of works. And we can also warp it a little bit once in place just to tweak it and make it look somewhat natural. And then if we want to use only the bit that fills the gap and not the whole copied object, then we can just add a layer mask to it, grab a black brush, and then brush into the mask to hide this layer over here to blend it in with the background. So it's a bit of a weird technique and it works best with organic shapes like rocks that are easy to blend in with each other. But keep this in your back pocket because you'll never know when it might come in handy. Now if you shoot a lot at sunrise, then you may have come across a phenomenon in the sky that makes it look all green and just horrible. It happens when the warm yellows of the sun mix with the cool blues of a clear sky near the horizon. And when you mix yellow and blue, you get green. And who wants a green sunrise? Anyway, the thing that is going to fix it is a simple curves adjustment. Just set to the green color channel, and then you can just gradually pull the green curve downwards until this green tint is reduced or eliminated. And then you can mask the effect in or out of the shot as needed. Or what you might notice is that sometimes it looks pretty good as a global adjustment. Either way, make this a staple of your sunrise editing diet and say goodbye to green rises forever. Now, I have a confession to make. I'm guilty. I'm guilty of doing something in the past that I'm about to tell you to stop doing. But, you know, we all have our own journeys. We all adapt and improve. We keep pushing forward. So the mistake I'm talking about appears when we learn how to do a new technique. And then because it seems so cool and awesome, we use it to the maximum extent possible on all our images without knowing where to stop. 
Now this is probably true for a lot of different techniques, but the big one that I want to share here is one that makes your images so full of detail that they become flat and busy at the same time. So what is it? Well, whether you're creating HDR blends or editing a single exposure, there's a tendency to want to bring out all the detail in the shadowy areas of an image by making them brighter. And then at the same time, you darken the highlights and add contrast to saturate the colors and make them pop. But the problem with doing this is that by making everything stand out, the whole image becomes really busy and distracting and absolutely nothing stands out at all. So here's the tip. You don't always need to see all of the detail in all of the shadows. Try letting some dark things stay dark relative to the rest of the scene. And by all means, brighten them a bit if they're a bit too dark, but just try not to overdo it. Because the more you brighten dark shadows and darken highlights, the closer your image gets to resembling that horrible, overcooked HDR look of years gone. Whereas keeping dark things dark and revealing just a hint of detail in the right places, you can create a much more intriguing image like this one. Now there's a bad way and a good way to make these selective adjustments, and I'll show you the best way in tip number seven. But while we have this image on screen, tip number six is a really quick and easy one for you to use, and it can save you a lot of headaches if you photograph moving water, because it can be really hard trying to color correct white water to make it look actually white, whether that's with the individual color channels of a curves adjustment, or with the hue saturation, or whatever else. For some reason, you just can never get it looking quite right. So instead of using color correcting techniques to make water white, just try making it lighter. A simple curves adjustment masked into the area that you want to affect will do the trick most of the time. Now you can use a simple brush into the layer mask to apply the curves adjustment in roughly the right places, but that in itself causes another problem, which is that it will still affect the areas that you don't want to affect because the brush just isn't accurate enough. And that brings us on to tip number seven and potentially the most important one of all, because virtually every kind of layer or edit can be affected by it. So what is this problem? Three words inaccurate layer masking, which means brushing over the edges with your adjustment layers and affecting parts of the photo that should not be affected. Now the good news is that it's actually an easy problem to fix. So watch this next video to see exactly how you can do it.